Good afternoon. I'm Christian Davenport, Professor of Political Science at the University of Michigan. On behalf of Dean Michael Barr, as well as the students and faculty at the Ford School of Public Policy, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Policy Talks at the Ford School event on policing. The title of the panel today is Police Reform or Revolution. Uh, given the racist violence that rocked the country this summer and continues to the present day, in many ways, we as a society sit on somewhat unclear foundations not sure of the path forward. On the one hand, we have reform, minor and or major changes that could be made to the personnel practices and governing policies employed by law enforcement as they interact with the citizens of this nation. On the other hand, we have revolution, and that is transformative changes that could be made to dramatically restructure how or even if the police interact with the citizenry. My fellow panelists today would have a wide range of experience relating to policing and police policy. I want to be clear today, though, that I'll be pushing the panelists because I believe that there are many who are done with discussing reform and they are advocating revolution. We do not have the latter position well represented on the panel, in part because of this sentiment, but also because activists are also just too busy being active. So as a consequence, I will give the voice to this particular position as deemed necessary um, to the panelists. Um, Lisa Dogard is director of the Public Defender Association in Seattle, where she's been leading an innovative effort on police reform. I hope I did not destroy your last name. Notably, she is the recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award. David Klinger is a professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Prior to pursuing his graduate degrees, Professor Klinger worked as a patrol officer for Los Angeles and Redmond, Washington uh, Police Departments. Roderick Johnson is a Towsley policymaker and residence at the Ford School and a partner in the Washington office of Brian Cave, recently served as assistant to the president and cabinet secretary to President Obama. There he launched the White House's My Brother Keeper Task Force, where he still serves as chair of the organization. Um, a couple of quick notes about the format. Um, we will have some time at the end of the event today for audience questions. Uh, we received some in advance, but you can also submit questions to the live chat on live YouTube. Um, tweet your questions to the hashtag policy talks um, with that to the panel. Uh, today, we're gonna do something a little unorthodox. Um, we're gonna walk through the thinking of our panelists concerning the, the policing problem at hand, essentially with the desire for the desire and willingness for revolution in the background as a backdrop to the conversation. As we've discussed initially, each of you will provide your diagnosis of the problem, uh, move toward your conception of what policing would look like in your ideal, situation, and then discuss your suggested path from getting from one to the other and take about 10 to 12 minutes to do that. And at 12, I will stop you. Um, with that in mind, uh, Lisa, David, Broderick, welcome. Um, Lisa, why don't you get us started and we'll move to Dave. Am I, can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, Really appreciate the chance to be here, and I really appreciate your frame, Christian. Um, I will dispute up front, though, um, the uh, sort of the typology. I think um, the, the the common framework of um, Radical transformation spans sectors, uh, you know, span, spans those who self-identify as advocates for abolition and revolutionary um, change, and many who have been um, working to um, mitigate or essentially engaged in harm reduction for our existing system. Those people are um, both outside the realm of policing and inside the realm of policing. So I think there's actually much less disagreement than these sort of, you know, X or Y frameworks um, might suggest, and that truly a lot of the um, a lot of the realm for debate is around how um, and what works. So I do want to uh, imagine the possibility that there's actually much more consensus around the scope of needed change. And that the um, the area for debate is really what is the most um, meaningful, efficacious, sustainable way in order to to make um, profound change. Certainly, that's my own um, story. I, I have worked on police reform. To be clear, that is not, however, the 
I think the work the work that you that I'm here to talk about is not I would not consider that to be police reform work. Um, I I have spent I have logged my time um, for 15 or more years in the project of police accountability work, um, as have many people. And I will say I'm pretty done with that. I I do not regard that as um, an a particularly effective, useful, or even interesting area anymore. Um, there are still lots of people laboring in those vineyards, and I don't want to, you know, you know, good luck to them. I hope that it <laughs> goes better than it has in my experience. But in my experience, that realm is one of um, kind of cleaning up after a system plays itself out in the way that it inevitably will, because the job of policing is generally framed up, framed up in a way that it necessarily produces results that cannot be rectified through formal accountability processes. As well, in general, the, um, the world of police accountability tends to be one of individual retribution. And ironically, the, the whole framework of restorative justice and um, you know, a, a lot of the rethinking that we've done about non, you know, harm by people who are not in law enforcement um, would dictate a very different approach to um, mistakes or misconduct that um, that police employees engage in. But those of us who have learned that lesson about other people's misconduct have not, you know, have a hard time applying it in the realm of policing. And as a result, you get this culture, this this activist culture, and I'm, this is a self critique. I mean, I was there for many years myself, um, of essentially what I call heads on pikes. So, like, we show that we don't like something by punishing an individual person, but very, very often, that those individual people are are almost random manifestations of a system that itself is never held to account. And I think that that practice of, you know, it, let's eliminate the rights of police officers, let's punish individual police officers, tends to drive an, a large sector into a very defended place and into a corner where they're not available as system transformation partners themselves, and they feel um, that they're being treated very unfairly. The system may not be being treated unfairly, but these individuals as sort of, um, you know, exemplars um, may legitimately feel that they're being individually made to carry the weight of, you know, hundreds of years of um, uh, racist, systematic oppression um, through many, many institutions. So I, so anyway, I, stepped off of our community police commission in Seattle last year in 2019, because I got to my own personal end of the road on that. Um, there are details about that in Seattle that are fascinating, but I, but not relevant to the sort of, you know, meta conversation nationally. Um, I chose I, for reasons that are specific to Seattle, I had to make a choice between remaining in that sort of accountability world or, um, concentrating my efforts on our work with LEAD, which um, when it was born was called Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. Now, recognizing that some communities are decentering police from response to the kinds of problems that LEAD was originally decide, uh, designed to respond to, law violations committed related to behavioral health conditions or poverty. Um, we have created an alternate name for the program, which is Let Everyone Advance with Dignity, which decenters but does not exclude police from a role in um, response to those kinds of problems. In any event, in my view, LEAD and similar efforts, LEAD is not, LEAD is an example of a methodology. It is not, you know, the only way that you could apply certain values, but what it was meant to be um, was a transformational vehicle um, to accomplish parad a paradigm shift in a system change where we, um, number one, kind of like an underground railroad, uh, allowed as many people as possible who had no business going to jail and prison related to um, the, you know, their participation in an illicit economy um, that they were forced into due to lack of choice, 
uh, or lack of options um, or substance use disorder or other behavioral health issues. Um, prevent as many people as possible from going, being prosecuted, going to jail, going to court. So like I said, underground railroad type of model. But at the same time, teaching everyone, the constituents of standard public safety models, law enforcement, lawyers, prosecutors, the criminal legal system, and um, community members affected by and suffering harm related to drug use and drug sales, um, teach everybody that it would work better to accomplish their goals, to, um, to, to respond in a way that made police, you know, a, a vanishingly small um, component of that response because there was something else. And in my view, I decided that if I had to choose, I would invest my time there because I think that actually has much greater potential for um, revolutionary impact. Um, and it accomplishes that in a way that builds the greatest possible consensus and base of support for a new way of doing things and does not alienate us from potential allies all, all around the landscape, public safety groups, people who thought of themselves as constituents of the old order and but are available to support a, a new way of doing things. And importantly, also making space for those who are in law enforcement for um, all kinds of valid reasons and would um, happily participate in a very um, different, uh, you know, in a very different role for law enforcement and really support that. I'll stop there. That's my own personal arc and um, what I see as the most fruitful um, way of trying to engineer um, maximum possible change. Lisa, thank you very much for that. Um, David. Yeah, it, it's really interesting that Lisa uh, was emphasizing the the word that uh, always pops up in my mind about stuff in that system. And focusing on the police officer, she said either misconduct or mistake is one way to look at it. And it doesn't get us very far. And that's because if you start looking deeper into what's going on, there are systematic problems. And when I say systematic problems, I mean problems within how police officers manage conflict. And so let's assume for the moment that we can't get rid of police. Let's assume for the moment that we need some institution in our society that is there to deal with people who are non-compliant, where there's going to need to be uh, some entity that has the capacity to use force. So sort of a Weberian notion that the, the, the state um, exists when the state has a monopoly on violence. And so we're going to need something. And I'm going to keep calling it the police. We talk about reform versus revolution, I would argue that what I and a small number of other uh, scholars have been dealing with in terms of this systems approach is a revolutionary way to approaching the issue of police from the flashpoint. And when I say the flashpoint, I mean those situations that create most of the consternation and conflict in society. And I'll go through it pretty quickly to make a very long story short. Um, in 1979, there was a mere disaster on the Three Mile Island um, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, when a nuclear power plant went sideways. And this very smart um, sociologist by the name of Charles Perot, in looking at that, talked about why it happened. He made a very simple argument. When you have things that are very, very complex and things that are tightly coupled, systems that are tightly coupled uh, and very complex, bad things are going to happen. And these bad outcomes are what he called normal accidents. Well, I and some others have built upon that notion. And if you think about what a police citizen interaction is, police citizen interaction is an opportunity for a system accident. That is something going wrong in the moment where bad things happen. And so the notion of trying to say, well, this officer was wrong and so we're gonna punish him, or we're gonna punish her doesn't get us very far because we then don't look at what led to that mistake. And let's let's talk about a mistake right now. A police officer, um, engages in some behavior that didn't need to happen when he or she uses force. What we want to do is we want to step back and look at the, the entire event from how the information was uh, brought to the officer's attention through dispatch, the information that the dispatcher got from the citizen who called in, we'll say it's a, it, it's a radio call, so on and so forth. How are officers trained to interpret this information? 
How are officers trained to communicate with other officers as they approach, as they get to the, the location, so on and so forth. And this leads us to another literature that came after Perot's notions of normal accident is called high reliability theory or high reliability organizations. There are things that we all engage in all the time that are very, very dangerous. We don't, we don't think about them as dangerous. Most of us have been in an airplane at least once or twice. Why in the world would you get in a, an aluminum can and fly 500 plus miles an hour, five miles above the earth? Because you trust the people that build it, you, the, the plane, you trust the people that are flying the plane, and you trust the system of air traffic control so you don't crash into each other, so on and so forth. And civil aviation became very, very safe by virtue of a series of mistakes and then learning from those mistakes and not looking at pilot error, but looking at how the system broke down. And so if we start applying that to policing, we can look at what went wrong prior to the event. And I'll very briefly talk about the Darren Wilson, Mike Brown encounter that happened a little bit over six years ago, not very far from where I uh, live here in the St. Louis area. And most people think about that and they think white officer, black suspect, unarmed, deaf, by definition, awful situation, no doubt about it. But if you think about how that in encounter started, Darren Wilson approached Mike Brown and his partner and got very tightly coupled, got very close. And that's where the initial encounter occurred that led to the whole thing. Well, sound police work dictates that you don't approach somebody who you might have a confrontation with in that fashion. What you do is you keep your distance. You don't couple. You decouple. You keep distance. You get out of your car after you've called for a backup. Now you have a different microsocial system with two officers. Most people are not going to be willing to take on two officers. But if they are, the officers are able to manage that with a far lesser use of force. So I don't want to get too deep into the weeds. But what I've done over the years and uh, some uh, academic pinheads like me, as well as police officers, we sit down and we critique shootings and other uses of force where officers did stuff. And we say, why didn't they do it this way back here? Why did they let it spin out of control to the point where it escalated? And so if we think about police officers as experts, that group in our society who we believe should be dealing with noncompliance, we want them to be expert. So the question is, why are they not expert? Why do police officers all around the country keep making mistakes of the ilk that Darren Wilson made that led to the Mike Brown shooting? Why is it that if you watch YouTube videos of police shootings, you'll see time after time after time, police officers getting too close, multiple police officers yelling and screaming as opposed to having one officer doing the talking, so on and so forth. So there is a literature and this notion of high reliability organization that says that you need to radically transform the culture of an organization or an institution in order to develop a mindset and a skill set so that you can deal with the tough job that you have to do. Probably the most dangerous four or five acres uh, in the world is a nuclear aircraft carrier in the United States Navy. Anybody who knows anything about naval flight operations, incredibly, incredibly dangerous. In very tightly coupled space, you've got tons and tons of jet fuel, ammunition, ordnance, all sorts of stuff. The US Navy hardly ever has a loss of life in a uh, aircraft launching and recovery operation. Why? Because they have built a highly reliable system. And there's another thing that goes along with this, talking about safety culture, about how it is you develop a safety culture. And once again, I don't want to go into the weeds now, but suffice it to say that there's a well-developed theoretical literature and a ton of empirical evidence in realms outside of police, that if the police adopted, they would be able to deal with noncompliance in a far more um, restrictive, for lack of a better term right now, fashion. There are going to be times and places where police officers have to shoot people. There is no doubt about it. Someone runs into your house and starts shooting at you. You don't want the police to show up and say, hey, excuse me, uh, we're out here and we're just going to stay out here. You want the police to come in and protect you. Um, so somebody who does that and then is running down the street shooting wildly through the neighborhood, you want the police to stop that person. Many times, the only option they have is gunfire. So you can't take that completely off the table. But what you can do is you can expect the police to do better. And the only way that line officers are going to do better 
is if all the way up and down the chain of command, there's expectation for excellence in dealing with non-compliant people. And when the review process from the sergeant, the lieutenant, the captain, the chief, whatever, identifies something, they then drive it back down and retrain the officers or remind the officers, here's how we need to do this stuff. And so my argument is that this requires a radical cultural shift about how police officers deal with noncompliance, how police agencies train officers to deal with noncompliance, and how the institution of policing deals with these situations and prepares officers. And, and I think this piggybacks back again to what Lisa was talking about, having honest reviews so that we can honestly identify where the problems are and then start wiping them out. So that's my my quick down and dirty on it. Okay, we're setting up a nice conversation. Broderick. Well, thank you. Um, I'm here, by the way, in my, my capacity wearing hats, for example, of a former Obama administration official, um, the um, continuing chair of the My Brother's Keeper uh, Alliance. It started as a task force in the White House, which I ran in the last three years of the Obama administration and now as part of the Obama Foundation. And then also in my capacity uh, as uh, as a, a professor uh, at Michigan uh, at the Public Policy School and also um, from time to time at the law school as well. So with those various hats on, let me just sort of start with how I got to this uh, this focus over the last several years, especially. And I, I wasn't among the people who day to day worked on policing reform in the Obama administration, but because of course of the overlap with the MBK related work and recommendations we did, um, I, I certainly uh, looked at these issues. You know, let me say first, revolution, reform, reimagining. And so I come at this from that other word, reimagining uh, police. And the reforms can be characterized uh, in that context as radical or as incremental, but there's just a whole series of things we can do to reimagine the relationship between police and the communities, especially communities of color, and especially the relationship and interaction between police and African-American male and females. And by the way, any kind of uh, reform or revolution or training has to, of course, take into consideration the fact that we live in a nation where systemic racism is profound. It has been profound. It continues to be profound. It continues to affect everything about our society. We have indeed made progress. There's no question, but we still have a lot more progress to make. So any systems, any individuals who are involved in major systems like police departments, like universities, uh, like financial institutions, we have to acknowledge the role of race and the importance of addressing race, identifying it, addressing it, and trying our best, of course, to eradicate the harmful effects of racism, whether they be in, uh, in terms of emotion or whether they, of course, have to do with life and death issues. You know, President Obama, uh, just a little bit going back in terms of the history on this, recognized these important issues uh, around community policing and relationships between the police and communities and as a result started uh, a, a, a task force and it was the 21st uh, century ta or the task force on 21st century uh, policing and he brought together uh, police officials as well as as activists uh, as well as policymakers and academicians from across the country. And we then, of course, released a series of recommendations. It was sort of in the middle of our second term. Uh, many police departments embraced those recommendations. But of course, when we left office, there were many that hadn't even started and there were many that stopped along the way. Um, but that work has continued. Uh, the recommendations have continued. They've been adapted to by many other organizations. There are police departments that continue to embrace those recommendations uh, and then to extend uh, those recommendations and to look at new things as certainly events have warranted. In terms of the work of President Obama continuing on this, uh, just in June of this year, um, he issued uh, sort of a, a challenge to 
uh, cities and counties across the country uh, to make a pledge to reform their police departments. There are over 300 uh, cities and other communities across the country that have done that, that have made that commitment. That's very, very, uh, that makes us optimistic, again, about um, the, the sense, the broad sense that there are many communities uh, and police departments that in fact want to make change. And so we've seen communities, for example, in Madison, Wisconsin, that have embraced uh, changes that uh, that are, are very progressive, as well as in Washtenaw County right there, close to, um, to Ann Arbor, uh, and many other communities as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's the view that we can, that better is good is something that uh, in so many ways continues to affect the way we view the changes that, that need, to be, need to be made. There's no question, no question at all that there's, uh, there's been a real um, backtracking of the kind of progress that we had been making before. But at the same time, because of the, you know, sadly because of the tragedies that have happened, but also because of the activism that has happened uh, throughout this country, especially going back to the summer, there is a significant appetite for change. We almost saw change at the federal level uh, with the policing reform legislation that was considered and passed in the House of Representatives that would have a, that would have banned uh, no-knock warrants and would have uh, ended qualified immunity. There was, a, as folks know, there was a Senate bill that didn't address qualified uh, immunity, but uh, had a lot of the elements in it that were also in the House bill and politics and timing being as they are. It all came to, uh, to uh, unfortunately, the clock ran out. But I believe that when we look to the next Congress and potentially the next administration, that things will get back on, on track at the federal level as well. But I just I, I would sort of end my opening comments with this. Change happens uh, significantly at the state and local level. And again, whether it's uh, major reforms or whether it's incremental reform, um, that's where those things happen the most and where communities can embrace the changes that have to happen. So that is, those are my opening uh, comments and I look forward to a dialogue here. Excellent, thank you very much for um, getting us started everybody. Okay, so um, let's dig in a little bit. Let's, uh, the rubber reached the road in many respects. Um, Paul Tilly used to say, uh, the devil's in the details and so, uh, Let's extract the devil a little bit. Um, so, Lisa, if I'm if I'm fair with the with the three characterization, let me know. Um, you see, the problem basically is a misapplication of police power. You see, an end of non misapplied force as being uh, the end objective. You see, and the means getting there is retraining. No, so I so I think that yeah, yeah. Um, no, I I think that um, what's been important over the last few years is to notice that in communities where that have heavily invested in you know any number of accountability strategies, training, policy change, the fundamental um, the fundamental dynamics between a police department and the community remain problematic because it is not only, and I really don't want to, I do not want to overdraw this, you know, it's, of course, training is important, of course, policy is important, and of course, um, accountability is important in any, for a public defender office, that's the sector I came out of, for teachers, for, you know, a sanitation department, you need all of those um, things as a as a sort of public um, you know uh, public asset, but the core dynamic is I think not um, not reachable through training policy or accountability, and the core dynamic is that officers are asked to do things that necessarily set them in an adversarial um, unhelpful relationship with people who are struggling for reasons that have to do with other systems failures, um, but officers' tools necessarily place them in a problematic relationship with those problems. 
And uh, that is not the fault of any individual officer. And there is no way to train your way out of that. You have to make a different set of options that officers then have you know, guidance around like, how do they relate to that? If they get called to a thing, how do they let go of that problem in a way that is not abandoning the situation, but transferring it to a place where it really belongs? That has been um, the work in that area, which has the greatest potential for transformation is the most starved. So in my book, that is the place that we need to um, spend our time because it will necessarily reduce the, um, the weight that training policy and accountability have to carry. We won't have set up those situations in the first place. So where is your opinion that you could be a reasonable action for that? Couldn't hear. Yeah. I'm sorry, we used to have that. Lisa, where do you think they are reasonable action? I didn't I didn't get that either. Where did I think the something came from? Unreasonable act. Oh reasonable act. No, no, the unreasonable act. Thank you. The unreasonable act. I'm still not. I'm still. We're getting an echo, Christian. Yeah, if everybody else can mute, then give me a second. Everybody else mute. Yes. Where did the unreasonable ask come from? Right. I mean, um, this is a nation so pervaded by. Um, interlocking um, interlocking failures and interlocking um, abandonments of large segments of our population that um, you know and and mass incarceration is definitely fed into that we have you know so many people who are now on the on the downslope of intergenerational trauma that it was engineered by public policy that everybody now says they regret um and it's going to take a long time for healing to um for healing to catch up to the harm that we've intentionally done but not only did this harm come out of um you know the sort of world of the the criminal legal system um, we've also done a poor job of educating people. We've done a poor job of housing people. We've done a very, very poor job of attending to the medical needs and the behavioral health needs of people. Um, and as a result, the uh, you know you have a landscape full of very serious problems and a very underdeveloped public um, architecture of response. So there are other countries where, you know, um, it's just as easy to call other systems of response as it is to call police. But in America, the only thing you that we are taught we can call and have come on demand is policing. So that's why. And because there does need to be, this is where I, I would like to say I'm as revolutionary as they come, but I do not believe that mutual aid and entirely voluntary and organic responses are sufficient. I believe that there must be systems of public response that everyone isn't, no matter what their network or identity, everyone has a right to call on those. And unfortunately, we have a country that has um, not developed those except in this one column, policing, which is the poorest match to many, not all, but to many of the problems that we will, um, uh, that, that the, that the, that the, that um, the public institutions are rightly going to be asked to solve. Thank you. Dave, I definitely see some um, overlap. At least I think you need to be you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so Dave, I definitely see some overlap with regards to what Lisa was discussing and what you were discussing. So two things. One, um, am I fair with uh, the problem are kind of like systematic mistakes? The objective is to have a well-trained police force that is not making these mistakes, and your means is radical change in the tactics or techniques. That's question one. Question two is, many people in the, com in the current conversation are discussing something like racial animus, right? But you've taken us in a very different uh, direction with regards to kind of a concatenation of errors that result in violence. And so um, why are we still stuck on this animus thing? And how and why should someone accept your, it's a concatenation of mistakes that results in the violence? Um, let me handle two first and hopefully I'll remember to go back to one. Um, 
I think that unfortunately a narrative, once a narrative catches with a group or a narrative catches about an issue, we, we tend to run with that. And so the, the argument that I'm making decouples from issues of race and gender and social class and whatnot and says there are, and this actually goes back to, to point one a little bit, there are known ways of managing um, difficult situations without having them spin out of control. And the police, the, the institution of policing, the history of policing, we, we know how to manage most things. The problem is that oftentimes we don't, when I say we, I mean the guys and gals that are the cops now, they're not able to apply that in the right way. And it's not, going back to what Lisa was saying, the line officer's fault, it's that they haven't been taught how to think systemically. And this also goes back to Lisa's point. So one of the things I was talking about is the notion of having deep, deep reviews of situations. If you look at um, quick narrative accounts of officer-involved shootings around the country, for example, Fatal Encounters, Washington Post, whatever, you will see time after time after time, it's someone who's in a mental health crisis who ends up getting killed. So the question is, among other things, that systematic review shouldn't just look at the police, but what about other institutions in society that could have been brought to bear? Maybe what should have happened in this case is a mental health worker should have showed up, perhaps paired with a police officer, because maybe there was some threat, um, but a mental health worker or a mental health crisis counselor, whatever you want to call them, who truly knows how to manage this, and then that changes the dynamic of the event. It changes the dynamic of that encounter from the start. Now, did I, did I cover them both, or do you want me to go back to either one or, or both? I'm good. That was good. So, so Broderick, um, a couple of things from these are these are three, but they're separate. They're related questions. Um, in a sense, what happened to our imagination? Did we ever have an imagination? And how do you cultivate an imagination regarding these issues? And who needs to have the imagination actually with regards to what to do? Is it the citizens, the well, police, politicians, movements, lawyers, all? Well, look, we've clearly imagined it wrong, right? So reimagining is not to say that we had this wonderful imagination about it, and now we need to look at it again. We, I mean, it's been wrong for a long time. So reimagining is, is I would, I would, I would sort of see that term differently, right? Um, but I want to actually go back to something that David said and, you know, this notion of the mental health crises and in many of the police involved shootings, there are mental health crises of the person who gets shot and killed by the police. There's no question there are instances like that. What apparently happened in Philadelphia was the case. But that was not the case with Tamir Rice. That was not the case with Elijah McClain. Um, that was that has not been the case in in so and you know in so many circumstances. Certainly, what happened in Minneapolis this past summer with George Floyd, and so um, you know the the notion that somehow you know if we just had different people come to the circumstances, they could handle it differently. You know I, that has the potential to make people think that uh, if we do that, but don't address deeply the the issues of bias around policing uh then we're not going to we're not going to solve this situation the way we need to we need to acknowledge that there's deep biases in in uh in the systems that that we have including in in the police systems so um anyway i wanted to say that just in terms of the of the victims of a lot of these shootings um around the mental health crisis issue I think that for a lot of our officers, though they do need, uh, to, to put this in a different perspective, they do need the availability of, of, of uh, you know, counselors and mental health crisis folks and others who can help many of them with the PTSD uh, symptoms that some of them experience because of the day-to-day -day stresses of the jobs that they have or where they've come from. And I think that is a very important part of any kind of effective, you know, uh, reimagining of police is to acknowledge that for a lot of police officers, um, there are some tremendous, you know, mental health uh, challenges for some of them as well. 
Fantastic. Um, Can I respond back to one thing real quick? I was about to say, Dave, quick response, and then we open up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't want uh, Broderick or anyone else to think that I was just saying that this notion of rejiggering the system and whatnot applies to the mental health piece. I was simply pointing out that that's a non-trivial aspect of the, 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 the challenge. Now, you mentioned Tamir Rice. As soon as I saw that, I said to myself, normal accident. That's the term Charles Perot talked about in terms of coupling and complexity. And what happened is the driver officer in the Tamir Rice case gets so close, two or three feet away. Why did he do that? Um, I read the officer's statement, and basically they completely misinterpreted what they had because they didn't have sa didn't have sound training, and they thought they needed to get up close. And then you had this weird situation with the ground and the brakes, and he got too close. But the bottom line is, there's other video out there of a police officer getting a call, and this was two black men, excuse me, two two young black guys um, outside in a very similar setting. And what he did is he didn't rush in. He stayed back. He contacted them from what we call behind cover, radio, got all the information and was able to resolve it. So, so my point is that when I talk about these notions of complexity and changing the system, it includes far more than the, um, the mental health piece that I was talking about. And so many times, as, as I was saying, when I and guys and gals that I know that know police work look at these officer-involved shooting videos, we're just shaking our head. Why did, why did they kick the door? There was no need to go in. And this goes, I think, back to something Broderick was talking about with no-knock warrants. Is there a time and a place? Sure, there's a time and a place for everything. But routinely, why are they doing that? When you've got somebody who is hiding inside a bathroom by themselves with a knife to their own throat, why would the police think it's a good idea to kick in that door? It makes zero sense. But these are the sorts of things that happen. And so I'm not trying to downplay that there are other things or say that the mental health piece is the only thing. I'm saying that that mental health piece is one way for us to think about the sorts of problems that the police are confronting and how we could change the system so they can do better. Sure. Actually, I'm definitely Thank hearing you. some similarities across folks as we're as we're dealing with a, a, a greater kind of like empathetic understanding of the conditions and the circumstances that people are finding themselves in and how that relates to kind of like a coercive wielding individuals and what institutional responses should take place between these. Many of us were speaking about this issue of kind of like how police and civilians should be interacting with one another. Um, opening up for a second though, we've been asked, um, to what extent do you feel that the defund the police label has injured the path to meaningful, thoughtful and sustainable, sustainable progress, which seems to be speaking to many of these points. Lisa. I think it's been very helpful um, to force, it's it's really been an Overton window contribution, if you will, of um, posing the question, what is the proper scope of the police responsibility? And how do you right size resources for the proper scope of police responsibility and what's missing? Um, there is, I think you can separate the defund framework, which poses that question, like where should we be putting our resources as a society with um, the manner in which that conversation is being um, is being advanced. And I have real um, regrets about the way in which that conversation is being advanced in that um, I think that there is, um, a, you know, there's an understandable and completely legitimate anger about the failure of accountability systems and so on to prevent such profound um, such profound harm that um, it's just kind of um, manifested in um, a, a way of communicating that is driving um, potential allies and partners um, away and and uh, probably fracturing potential alliances for a generation. So, but you know what, like there's no point in, that's happening for a reason and it's not something that anybody gets to control or or design. Um, that anger is there and that, that almost um, sort of lack of concern about alienating potential allies is there because of um, a failure to make the big paradigm shifts um, when we should have. And that was a long, long time back. So I don't think it can be avoided. Um, 
that's again for my work i look for places where we can actually find one another again um notwithstanding both sides feeling so hurt and so misunderstood um that's a reality we can't undo that so how can we make a space where willing partners can eventually find one another again i mean what's sorry lisa <laughs> what's uh what's interesting is this um desire for folks to kind of like understand exactly how people mobilize around different things i thought that the idea of um rather than defund the police, it should be, let's reprioritize America, but that doesn't sound the same way. It's not focused in the same manner, but what we're asking for is a consideration as Broderick was going towards. We need to reimagine exactly what that world would look like, what, what it is we're trying to push for. Um, not the beloved community by, might be one way you're trying to frame it or, or think about it, but we're trying to reimagine this relationship between people in a space where we really haven't had an opportunity to reflect on what we would like to live with and what we would accept and understand everyone's positions, right? I'm not, I'm not one necessarily as a black male in America. I'm not one necessarily to automatically take a police position, despite the fact I have many relatives on the job. I'm more likely to be antagonistic to the whole dynamic, given exactly how that power has been used against me. Dave, one of the reasons we got along in the first place was he was able to kind of break things, break things down to me from a different perspective that I was able to kind of see for a moment. But once you start understanding, as Lisa was suggesting, that the police are in many respects placed in an untellable situation. They're forced to basically deal with the vagaries of political economic inequality, and they're the front, they're the front person for representing the state in this war against what we're going to do with these people that have been disenfranchised and left to their own devices in many respects. And so without the support system for that, we're, we're left in a very complex distinct situation and as people have mobilized to the best of their ability, defund the police was like an idea that they came up with, but really they're talking about let's reprioritize and let's rethink exactly where we are. Lisa, you had something before we go to Friday. Yeah, I just wanted to name that um, many sectors are called upon to notice when that you need to give way because, and it's not um, against you. Um, so, you know, in climate, in climate work, right? There are there are economic sectors that need to transform in order that we survive as, um, <clears throat> so that the planet can survive. It doesn't mean that the people who did that work are not honorable people. Public defenders need the the my sector, you know, public defense needs to become smaller. There need to be fewer people who are assigned lawyers um, because we need to play, you know, handle fewer kinds of problems in that way. And stewards of each area, including police, you know, need to be able to say, yeah, I, I think we're the progressive police leaders that are really quite courageous right now are saying like, I am fine with a reduced scope of police responsibility. And yes, that necessarily does mean a reduction in resources, but I need the resources for the job that I'm gonna be left with. You know, that is, um, that's the, uh, enlightened self-interest position to take. And so, um, yeah, just, just naming that all sectors ultimately must, you know, ought to recede when they're useful, you know, w when the role that they need to take transforms. That's the natural course of things. It's just very hard for people. Well, it's a natural course of things in terms of logic, but not necessarily in terms of organizational survival. <laughs> so, uh, Broderick, you had something? Yeah, I was going to admit this on the, the defunding the police uh, uh, language. Um, uh, our college age daughter um, just, you know, we were at dinner. This is in the summer. She said, Dad, what do you think about defunding the police? And of course, you know, my uh, initial uh, comment back to her was, well, what do you mean? I mean, that's crazy. We, we, that won't happen. And uh, so we had a back and forth. And it was so important that we both listened to each other, right? Because what she was saying to me was, you know, we need to consider the priorities and redirecting priorities. And it was a much, it was well beyond, right? A, you know, a, a brand or a few words. It was much deeper than that. And on the other hand, I needed to help her understand that throwing out a term like defunding the police in many situations was going to shut down the conversation. That was it. There was not going to be any dialogue between she and the person who objected to what it was that she 
had thrown out there. And so that is such a big part, especially in a kind of political uh, and news environment, social media environment we live in now, where when, when a term gets used before you know it, it is blown up perhaps well out of pro proportion, well out of what was actually intended in the first place. And so this listening, and this is where police officials, you know, need to listen. Uh, rank and file officers need to listen. And then, you know, citizens do as well to understand. Very true. Okay. Question two. Um, are we able to identify things that cause or encourage a particular kind of culture within police departments? What about the culture? What about that culture makes it hard for police organizations to reform from within? Anybody? I would argue, once again, going back to the normal accent and HRO things, um, police leaders haven't really thought about it in this way because they don't understand these basic notions of systems. But when I start talking to folks in law enforcement and explain to them what I'm talking about or have them read something that I've written, they're like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. This is the type of stuff we need to do. And by the way, this is part of a much broader um, move in the American criminal justice system. I'm sure Lisa is quite familiar with, for example, on things like wrongful convictions. We can go ahead and we can say we've got a bad prosecutor or somebody lied or there was a bad uh, you know, bite mark, a testimony, whatever the case might be. But the real question is typically what happens is there's going to be a series of mistakes. And the theory of the case that the detectives had when they first went out looking for the guy or gal that they thought did the the, the heinous crime, that's the that that's where it starts. And so this notion of reviewing a wrongful conviction to try to figure out, not pointing a finger necessarily, but what's wrong with the system? That's the way to get at this. Now, we also have to remember there's going to be bad cops. There's going to be bad prosecutors. There's going to be people that are going to lie to get out of a, uh, a sentence in terms of trying to finger somebody. All that stuff happens. But if you start from the notion that the people in the criminal justice system generally, the workers, are trying to do their best, but they don't know how to think about it and they don't have the tools, um, that's the problem. So there are there are folks around the country that are promoting this system, systematic review of policing, of prosecutors' offices, uh, of public defenders' offices, so on and so forth, to try to figure out how to get rid of wrongful convictions. Exact same principle applies, but law enforcement executives, by and large, haven't been taught to think this way. They've been taught to think about what Lisa was talking about early on, about accountability and policy and so on and so forth. And that's why my argument is that we need to radically shift the culture of policing towards one that puts safety, when I say safety, not just the safety of the suspect, the safety of the officer, but we don't want wrongful convictions, we don't want to arrest people, don't go to jail, and we certainly don't want to shoot people that don't need to be shot. But Dave, quick, before we go to Lisa, what is your mechanism of that shift? The mechanism of the shift is to put out there into the realm of the law enforcement um, leadership community how to think about things in this new and fresh way. And I and some others have started to do that. Larry Sherman um, has had, wrote, wrote a piece a couple of years ago. There is a group at the University of Pennsylvania Law School that is working on this. So it's a matter of getting out the, the, the message that this is something that works elsewhere. We should do it in law enforcement as well. I'm like, uh, Thomas Kuhn wasn't too happy about the possibility of a paradigm shift, man. So forgive my, uh, forgive my, my, my pessimism on that one. Lisa, you had something though. <laughs> There are a few uh, people trying to lead police departments um, in the direction of culture change. And I just um, think that it, it's incredibly important to listen to them, um, you know, inventory the obstacles that they have faced. In my own city, um, there was a genuine reformer who was interim chief back in 2014, and he was shown the door um, due to um, the um, resistance to profound change from within the department that played itself out in just a textbook way where the, the institution and the culture defends itself against, um, you know, profound change even when led from within. Um, so I know um, Sheriff Clayton in Washington, uh, there are just a few people who, you know, 
what, what problems do you encounter? External political forces that put pressure on you to do things that are not, um, that are not helpful. Um, the constraints from union contracts, the difficulty, you know, any manager managing a large workforce has challenges, um, all the more so when um, the labor, you know, agreements sharply constrain visionary managers' efforts to do what needs to be done. Um, they, there are huge, there are huge barriers, and even when a lot of progress is made, um, it is, uh, it's hard to sustain and hold it. So this is one of the reasons why I've just decided. I, I feel like the more we can right size policing um, and um, not rely so heavily on um, changing the institution, but but match it to problems that it is uniquely equipped to solve, the better off we'll be, because it's just always going to be hard. Frederick, you have something? Yeah, you know, you mentioned, Lisa, you mentioned uh, Sheriff Clayton, and uh, he was uh, one of the headliners on our Obama uh, Foundation, My Brother's Keeper, Reimagining Police Workshop the other day. He, uh, as well as a number of other um, African-American uh, police uh, leaders, including uh, a, the, a black woman who is the police chief in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is interesting. Her experiences very much, I'm sure, model what is you know, the case in Washington County with the University of Michigan having its own force and all that. But the thing that's that uh, Sheriff Clayton said that really stuck with me the most is that we have to look at uh, reforming things, making changes, addressing the relationship issues between uh, particularly African-American males and the police when we're not in a crisis, when it's not the result of something, you know, some horrible tragedy or other things that have happened but to do it in times when things are more relatively calm. And as we know, often that's not the case. You know, people respond to crises rather than do than they do to more calm waters. But I think that's extremely important uh, observation by him and um, wish him really well there in Washtenaw County with that perspective. Thank you very much, Patrick. We're, um, we're basically at time. What I find interesting about this is um, uh, I like Lisa's idea of this right sizing of policing and Dave's idea of the right calibration of what tactics need to take place and Broderick's conception of kind of like rethinking through how exactly we get to where we get to. What I find interesting is we had uh, some initial ideas about what policing were and then they got institutionalized and that got diffused across space and time and then that developed momentum. And so then the question is, are the people that are in these things able to get themselves out of this problem or does do they need the shock or something from outside to bring it or is it this dynamic interaction between the two? And unfortunately, what we know from org theory, change does not rarely, change rarely happens from within. Um, and so there's going to be a dynamic necessity for the populations that occupy the country to assist in the restructuring of exactly how we wish to live and how we wish to specifically deal with individuals that carry weapons officially for the state. Um, but I wanna thank all of you for um, participating today. This has been quite an interesting conversation and definitely um, hopefully we're allowed to continue this in this particular venue, but I'm sure everyone will be continuing to do what they're doing, where they're continuing to do it because this is clearly beyond the scope of one conversation. I'm sure we've all been in a million Zooms addressing these issues as we've been proceeding forward. But um, everyone be well. Thank you very much for that. It was uh, it was uh, very interactive and uh, a lot of fun, actually. Thank you very much. For that. Nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you all. Thanks so much. Thank Chris. you. Thank you.